Sometimes we have a real problem with the word intimacy. Some of us find that it's rooted in our culture. Men often avoid talking about intimacy, especially when it connects with God, because we've pretty much had a feminist worship experience, or feminine rather, worship experience most of the time. We love it when the women dance and they worship and they are vocal, but we men, it's just not masculine. But let's change our view for a moment and say, how does God feel about this? Sometimes when I read key passages from the Bible, I try to imagine God's personal response to the action of the people that he loves. Now, I'm going to go through some things you've heard me talk about before, but in the context of this, set, this series, they need to be said once again. Is that okay? When I read about creation, the book of Genesis, I think to myself, how did God the creator feel when things went wrong in the Garden of Eden? First, I made man and breathed my own breath into him, and then I put him in the garden and formed a woman from his own body. I knew he wanted and needed a custom-crafted companion that was bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. After I gave Adam his heart's desire, I gave him authority to keep my garden, to enjoy the fruit of its abundance, and to rule over the created world. I only gave one limitation, one warning, that he not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Then Eve finds the one thing I've forbidden, and she finds it irresistible. And Adam joins her in the meal, this meal of sin and guilt at Satan's urging. And how should I feel about Adam and Eve when I, too, choose the very thing that I'm asked not to? If I were God, what would be my first reaction? I don't know about how you feel if you were God, but I can tell you how I'd feel. How dare you? I gave you everything in the world, Eve. Why would you do this to me? If it were up to many of us, the human race would have ended right there. <laughs> Think about it. We should all be glad that it was up to God because he's a God of love and mercy because he found a way to satisfy his righteous nature <laughs> and he also preserves his beloved creations. Here's my paraphrase. Lindellology. Okay, you blew it. Now I have to evict you from the Paradise Garden Apartments. The bad news is you can't ever come back into your current state and Eve, you're going to have a hard time having babies. Adam, things won't grow themselves as they used to in the garden since you've chosen to step out from under my roof of protection. Now you'll have to earn your way and you're going to have to sweat to make a living. Since you decided Satan's tough old road is the one you want to go, you're going to discover just how tough life can be without me. The good news is I've already provided a way back. <laughs> then I read about Abraham. Abraham was a moon worshiper. We don't know all the details, but somehow God reveals himself to Adam, I mean to Abraham, the idol worshiper, and he caught the fancy for God. And based on nothing but a promise from an invisible God, Abraham followed God's command to leave his homeland for a promised land he had never seen. The bless, the bless, this blessed God so much. What, little secret. Great worshipers learn to be great, obedient people. Because nothing makes the one we worship happier than just pure obedience. To obey is better than sacrifice. I don't want your offerings, I want your life. When I read the book of Exodus, I step into God's shoes mentally. I do that just enough to imagine how he must have felt when the children of Israel witnessed all the wonderful miracles that he did through Moses and Aaron and being delivered from Pharaoh's iron grip. And then they rejected God. When I saw how... The Israelites abused his love, scorned his law, ridiculed his leadership. 
disobeyed his commandments at every turn. I, I was thinking if I were God, I would have fired up my barbecue <laughs> for some crispy rebel. But thank God he had a better idea. Unfortunately, the sad tale of God and his chosen people just keeps getting worse as you go into the Old Testament. At one point, the children of Israel make Moses move the tent of meeting outside of the camp because they said, Moses, your face scares us when you've been with God. Your face looks funny. You have too much God on you. We would rather live worldly. We would rather be about this world. You've got another world on your face and it's frightening. Would you mind moving that? Do y'all hear the hurt? Can y'all hear the hurt? God says, babies, I just want to have a tent where we can meet. And I'm going to send Moses in there and he's going to come out with the smell and the fragrance of me. And when when he came out of the tent, the people went, you smell funny and you look funny. Why don't you, I tell you what, just go to church on Sunday and let the choir sing And let's not move the church into our home. Let's not have worship times in the floor in front of our coffee table where we weep and cry and worship the Lord and dance around our house. Let's not, that's only for church because that's, you know, it's for the performance of the congregation. Pretend to be God for a minute. You're down to basically one man you can trust. And now the people are even rejecting him because he comes back from a meeting with the remnant of your glory still shining on his face. They as much said, Moses, you smell like God. We don't want it. All God wanted through that whole time was to embrace his children, be intimate with them. But they constantly rejected him. And finally... He would only speak to them through prophets and they chose to kill the prophets. They sawed them in half. Things get so bad that the affection of God is so evident in the life of King David. You see the beautiful poetry of David in the Psalms starts to disappear as you read the New Testament and go forward. It and it, 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 it eclipses into stern warnings from the prophets. And God says, I guess only catastrophic solutions will do at this point because tenderness didn't work. Somebody says, oh, isn't that horrible? No, that's beautiful. It's beautiful that God, when I res- when I." Sp- when I reject his gentleness, will by his great love cut all paths of escape off and strip me down bare and say, okay, you're coming through me or you're leaving me, but I will not have this anymore. The relentless sea, even though you are half-hearted in your love for him, he's not half-hearted in his love for you. And he'll go, I'll do whatever it takes to get you. If blessing won't work, I'll take away the blessing. But I won't stop. Can anybody say thank you, Jesus? <laughs> that he hasn't stopped? <laughs> oh, yes. There are times I wanted him to, but he just won't leave me alone. Have you ever got mad at him and said, I don't like church, I don't like people, I'm done. I was going to be normal, whatever that is. Normal on my way to hell. I want to go to hell. Too hard to go to heaven. Let me finish. The unfaithful woman, Israel, she has to go through a near-death experience at the hands of her worst enemies before she will give up her many lovers. By the time we reach the book of the Minor Prophets near the end of the Old Testament, it feels as if I'm living next door to a couple camped on the divorce court. They're they're on the front door of the divorce court. The man is a faithful husband and he has a prostitute for a wife. 
Every word that came through, it's as if the apartment walls are paper thin. I heard about every affair she's had and how every man that she's loved. And when the avenue of immediate mercy seemed to be exhausted, the husband told his cheating wife that he's gonna kick her out. She could repent and return or she could go eat scraps with her supposed lovers. Every extension of mercy was followed by even more episodes of adultery, insult, and rejection, and ungrateful in this uncaring wife. The problem is this isn't the story of an average husband and wife next door. It's the story of God and the rocky relationship he has had with his beloved covenant people. If you move from the Old Testament to the New Testament, you still see things didn't change much. God in his faithfulness always returns to, true to his word. First he sent his only begotten son, the, the sacrifice of sins, and the response of the Jews and the Gentiles is they team up to crucify him. Jesus asked the Father to send the comfort of the Holy Spirit, exactly as God promised in the Old Testament and prophecy of Joel. Only a few generations after the Holy Ghost comes on the day of Pentecost, we look we see him being taken for granted to such extent that some leaders mistakenly declare his supernatural ministry is no longer needed in the modern church. Although we call ourselves Christians, many of us still reject God today. We tend to want his blessings, but we don't care to invest time in him. We want healing. We want our lives to be changed as long as it doesn't hurt too much. We want a nice house, good health, freedom from guilt, nice clothes to wear. We object, however, if God shows up and it's inconvenient for our schedule. We frown if he says, I'm not coming till three o'clock in the morning. Will you tarry till I come? Few members of the first church of the quick blessing are willing <laughs> to wait past the inconvenience or in any self-sacrifice. God can't manage to show up by noon on Sunday, we're out of here. They have appointments to keep, dinners to eat, television shows to see. If God tries to tap them on the shoulder in the middle of the night while they're sleeping, he says, you need to get out of bed and talk with me. Most of them will immediately roll over and say, I'm busy, I have to get up early. One of the more subtle forms of the bless me syndrome is the persistent search for the latest free ride in the spirit. It's as if we're spiritual surfers hoping to bum a ride on the next big wave of God. We often ask one another, when do you think the next great thing is coming? When's the next great revival? I realize that this is a legitimate place for people to examine the times and seasons, but, and God is doing great things in this generation, but the modern charismatic church in the Western nation has nearly elevated this looking for the next great wave into a form of idolatry. My question is this as I close. Hasn't God already done enough? When Jesus said it is finished, did he mean it was finished? We examine the Bible and we record the book from Genesis to the book of Revelation at the end. We begin to understand how grieved God's heart has been through rejection, hardness of heart. And I, Lyndall Cooley, am responsible for some of that hurt. All he wants is relationship with me. And honestly, friend, it's not that hard. It's only hard to please God when you try to please yourself at the same time. Well, I didn't come for this sermon today. This is this pastor's heart. I don't expect it to be your heart, but I can't pastor you until you know mine. This is why I jump up and down. This is why I smile when I feel like crying. I'm not superhuman. I'm in love with God. I'm not perfect. I'm a mess, but I'm in love with God. And I can't bear for us to come together 
and sing just about his goodness, I have to sing to him. I can't bear to sit and be depressed while I'm singing worship songs and weeping and rocking back and forth in my own self-pity when the king is sitting in the midst of us and he's done nothing but good to me. He's never failed me. He's never turned a deaf ear in the midnight hour. He's always been faithful. He's always been good. I've noticed that my marriage to Amber works very well as long as I don't think about me. When I start thinking about me, trouble isn't far behind. Worst time you will ever have in marriage is when you start feeling that your mate didn't consider your feelings. Well, the decision they made or an action that was taken, you ought to know how I feel, but you didn't even take it into consideration, did you? You weren't very considerate, you jerk. See, selfishness and self-centeredness in any form causes trouble in marriages, but it also makes it impossible to follow Jesus. I close with this. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him Say it with me. It's hard. I know it's hard to get it past your teeth, isn't it? Let him. Let him. Does that mean I don't have needs? No, it means I deny them. Take up his cross daily. I believe there's another wave coming. But I have to teach this church how to love Jesus. I know you love him, but I've got to get you to press past you. And I've got to get you to come into this agreement with me. When he comes, what's he going to get? As far as I'm concerned, fat boy is going to dance, cry, holler, worship, revel in him. I'm going to brag on him. I'm going to be joyful in him. Oh, I'm going to bless his name because he's never failed me. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness. I wonder if we could just stand together as we close this meeting and sing that again. Great is thy faithfulness. Oh, come on, Grace, sing it. Great. Morning, 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 new mercies. Oh, oh, I, I, have I have needed thy hand, have provided. Great is thy faith. Now, next week, I'm going to talk about love carrying the day. I'm going to talk about pink houses <laughs> next week. I won't be as heavy next week, but this is not heavy with guilt. This is the heavy heart of a passionate lover of Jesus. Oh, friend. Somebody says, oh, he's talking about how wonderful. No. How can I help but love him? When I look at your face every Sunday morning, I literally want, I'm not joking. I'm not saying this so you'll, this will help you make sense of some of the things I say. Listening to my heart today will help you make sense. When I get out of my truck on Sunday morning, there are many Sundays I feel like I should probably get on my hands and knees and crawl to the door because I shouldn't be standing here. 
Somebody says, oh, that's guilt. That's that old guilt conscience. No, that's thankful. That's thankful because you shouldn't be here. We shouldn't be here. But because of his great mercy, <laughs> I challenge you this week to focus and magnify his greatness. If you've got trouble in your home, focus on him. Somebody said, hey, that's just, that's just, no, no, friend, it works. You got, how many got financial trouble? Put your bill, put your bill full away, stick your checkbook in the drawer, go out in the front of your house and go, Lord, I don't know how to say thank you for this beautiful home I live in. I don't know how to say thank you. Oh, for the meal I ate today. Oh, great is thy faithfulness. Start singing it around your house and just magnify every dew drop of blessing that comes your way. Oh, sometimes it comes like a thunderstorm. Other times it comes like a mist. But every little drop that falls on my face, excuse me while I focus on it. I think I'm going to magnify these dew drops of blessing until they look like Niagara Falls. I think I'm going to magnify the goodness of God until that's all I can see. And then when the enemy comes and says, what are you going to do about that? I go, great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by Now watch this. I'm going to be landy. Ready? All I have needed thy hand has provided. Now here's how Landy looks at the choir. <laughs> All. All I have And here's the message Bible version of that. Never been a problem so big that he can't solve it. Never been a problem so big that he can't solve it. Never been a need too great he can provide it. All I have needed. All I have needed. All I have needed. You have provided all I have needed, all I have needed, all I have needed. You have provided. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness, Lord, to me. I gotta let you go. Is this fun? I love grace. Our prayer team is here. I got to let you go. Our prayer team is here. I wish we could just go on because I could make up some really awful hymns. I love you, Grace.